Thank you. Um, Opa, as Lucas will be able to tell you with his year, seven-year-old German means grandfather, um, which is what I'm here to talk about, my grandfather who was a resistor in Germany during the Second World War. Um, I've got a cold, so I had the choice of going, oh, I've got a cold, I'm not doing it. And then I thought, my grandfather stood up to the Gestapo. <laughs> I'm not letting a cold stop me. So yes, I am comparing myself to someone who stood up to the Gestapo because I've come here with a cold, so yay me. Um, right, so this little chap, he stands on the entrance of the town of Norden, which is where my mother comes from. He's saying Moin because they don't speak proper German there. They speak a dialect called Pladuch. Um, so instead of saying Guten Morgen, they say Moin. It's a map of Germany. Um, if you look up the top, it's really hard to see, but there's a little string of islands that goes across the top of Holland and Germany. Um, and my grandfather was born on one of those islands. It's called Norderney. If anyone's read Riddle of the Sands, it's set around there or seen the film. Uh, this is how I remember my childhood in Germany. I am the little blonde in the white T-shirt. Uh, my sister is the other blonde, and my brother is the other blonde. So we are like the master race, because we're very blonde and blue-eyed. Um, and that's my mum in the James Bond bikini. And that's my Oma in the chair, my grandma. Um, this is uh, the last time we went to Germany. I don't know how many years ago it was. How many years ago was it, family? I don't know. Oh, I don't know either. <laughs> anyway, um, this is the Deich. So uh, it's all reclaimed land where my mum comes from. Um, so we're on the sea side of the dike. Everyone rides bikes because it's completely flat. This is to show you the other side of the dike. <laughs> and that's to show you how flat it is. Uh, they're actually having to make the dike higher because the storm surges are getting higher with global warming um, and it's no longer protecting the land. This is to show you a windmill, because I love them, and um, it also shows you how close to Holland they are. It's very influenced by the Dutch. Um, so this is my granddad with a completely mad hairstyle. <laughs> um, he was not a dandy bloke at all, so I don't know what the hell he was thinking when he went to the barbers on that particular occasion. Anyway, his name um, is Johann Gottlieb Fischer. Gottlieb means to love God, which is quite funny because he became an atheist very early on, um, but was saddled with that middle name. So he was born on the island of Norderney on the 1st of March, 1895. His dad buggered off, basically, and left his wife with four children on the island. So my great-grandmother was an incredibly hardy woman, as people often were in those days, and the family story is of her having to carry a child sick with diphtheria on her back onto the ferry and across to the mainland to the nearest um, hospital. My opa was really intelligent and he got a scholarship to the grammar school which was on the mainland in Norden, uh, but they didn't have any money so uh, he couldn't go because they couldn't afford the uniform or the fare to get him there or anything. Um, so he was educated at local school on the island and he left there at 14 to be, be, begin an apprenticeship as a typesetter. Um, and it was through this apprenticeship that he first came into contact with the trade unionist movement and he became very interested in politics and basically throughout his life he was driven by politics, um, left-wing politics, improvement of availability of work and bringing more opportunities to Ostfriesland. So Ostfriesland is the area that the town is in and Geographically, it's a bit like being in the Highlands of Scotland. That's how far away it is from the centre of politics. Um, the main industries are farming and tourism. Um, so after his apprenticeship at the year of, uh, age of 18, you do something called a, vande a Vandeschaft, your Vandella Gazella. I'm really sorry anyone who speaks German because my German is really shit. But anyway, um, 
So you literally walk from town to town with your little pack on your back and you go, in his case, from print works to print works, learning your trade. They give you your board and lodgings. Um, you don't get paid. It's kind of like an apprenticeship, but moving round. But in 1914, he was conscripted into the Kriegsmarine, the wartime navy, um, which he served in until the end of the war with a short stint in a prisoner of war camp and he was demobbed in 1918. So he came back uh, to the island and he joined the Social Democratic Party of Deutschland, Germany, which is basically the equivalent of the Labour Party, so it's no more left-wing than that. Um, in 1920, he moved to the mainland and he got a job at the local newspaper printers, Druckerei Zoltau, and he also became involved in the workers' uh, movement. So he was now getting more and more involved in the political life of the town. During this time, he met my Oma. Um, that's her confirmation picture, so she's 13, which I think she looks a lot older than 13, but there we are. Um, so she had the most fantastic name. She was called Wilhelmina Carolina Amalia Gritcher Tunsman. Uh, Gritcher is a, an Austrian name. You wouldn't find it in the rest of um, Germany. So she was brought up as a Dutch reformist um, and had gone to all the church youth groups. But when she met my granddad, they started going to all the socialist groups. And they had a group for absolutely bloody everything. They had walking groups, gymnastics groups, singing groups, drama groups. They just had a group, anything they had a group for. Um, so my Oma was introduced to a whole new world through my Opa. Um, I don't know why I put this picture in. I think it was just to show how lovely they were <laughs> with the dog. Um, that's my great-granddad. He worked on the railways. My great-grandma and great-grandpa had a lot to do with my mum and her sister's lives. Um, because my opa was either involved in politics or later on he was taken away a few times by the Gestapo, you know, as, yeah, as happens. Um, so they were quite involved in the, the lives of their kids and they, when, when my grandparents got engaged, my great-grandparents built a house attached to the end of their house and very unusually for the time, they put the deeds in their daughter's name. Um, that is my Tanta Elsa, um, in a very natty swimming costume. Um, so my grandparents married in 1922 and Elsa was born in 1924. In 1926 my Opa became a town councillor and then in 1930 a county councillor. Um, in 1929, he was chairman of the SPD, the SPD. Um, and after the First World War, during the Weimar Republic time, he was responsible for a lot of the rebuilding of the, the country between the two wars. Um, in 1928, his union comrades persuaded him to start work as manager of the co-op in Norden. Um, he really loved that job and was very proud of the cooperative principles that it worked on. Um, so bear in mind that 1924, which is the year this little girl was born, um, is also the year that the National Socialist Party was formed, the Nazi Party. Um, and by 1929, there was a branch of the Hitler Youth Movement in Norden. Uh, which children from the age of 10 could go to. This is a picture of um, my great-grandparents, my grandma, my mum and her sister. It just kind of shows that my granddad was absent a lot of the time. That's my mum! Oh, that is just a classic baby on a rug picture, so that's why that's got to be in there. Um, so my mum was born in 1935, but in 1933, two years before she was born, Hitler had declared himself Reich Chancellor and all other political parties had been banned, and so had trade unions, and so had group meetings of any sort. Um, my grandfather basically ignored this and being manager of the co-op became useful because they used to have their meetings at the co-op and they used to um, use the co-op for printing leaflets and distributing flyers. At the turn of the century, uh, there were about 5,000 people in Norden. There were about 70 Jewish families. 
Um, when Hitler came to power, lots of people didn't realise what lay ahead. They thought he was a bit of a clown, they thought it wasn't really going to change. There was a big north-south divide in Germany. Um, the southern states were more pro-Hitler generally than the northern states, but there were lots of people in Norden who were gung-ho for Hitler. Um, so my opa could see that things were going to go badly wrong and was distributing flyers over the border in Holland saying you need to wake up to what is happening in Germany because it's going to be really bad for you too and of course it was. Uh, things were getting quite dangerous for the family at this point. They were having meetings in the house um, and they were listening to the World Service and uh, my Oma would say, oh look, the boot marks are there again. They had brown shirts watching the house standing in the snow. Um, my Oma was friends with a Jewish family called the Wolfs, and that was really not what you were meant to be doing. 1933, there was already a boycott of um, Jewish businesses. And in 1933, the newspapers talked about the newly erected concentration camps, uh, they were more like hard labour camps in that area, in Emsland, which is near Bremen. And they were saying how fab they were and how they could fit 4,000 criminals in and it would be strictly guarded and people were encouraged to shop their neighbours, which is really brilliant. Um, so there we are. Anyway, my mother was like a little ray of sunshine, apparently, in um, troubled times. And then in 1937, when my mum was two, uh, after a house search, the Gestapo took my grandfather away. My mum said the house searches weren't just like a little, you know, they didn't just rifle, they cut open duvets and they smashed wardrobes. And she has this lasting memory of a pair of jack boots because she was only small and that's what she could see of this Gestapo guy who took her dad away. Um, so he was charged with belonging to an illegal Bremen resistance group, which was true, um, and he was sent to the newly constructed concentration camp um, to dig peat for two years. Uh, fortunately, he did only serve two years and he did come back home after that, because often you would get two years sentence, but you wouldn't come back. I like this picture because of the man. Can you see him lurking in the background? So they're off to the Oktoberfest. And already this um, Nazi guy, it's already part of the fabric of the town that these people are there. Um, the first time that my Oprah was taken away, my mum actually became ill and she stopped being able to walk and she had to be taught how to walk again and they put it down to the trauma of her dad being taken away. Um, and then she said when he came back, she remembers him picking her up and he smelled funny. <laughs> Been in a concentration camp for two years, so I guess he did. Um, and she didn't really like the stubble on his face, but she said she looked into his eyes and she felt a connection, which is rather lovely. Um, in 1938, there was Kristallnacht, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and uh, in Norden, this happened, which I find really weird, because I loved going to Norden for my childhood holidays. And then when I was researching this with my mum, I thought, oh my God, really terrible things happened. Uh, they rounded up all the Jewish people, they took them out to the countryside, they beat them all up. They burnt down the synagogue in the meantime, and then they brought the beaten up people back, and they made them search through the remains of the synagogue to find anything that hadn't been destroyed, and they made them destroy it. So they were really nasty, those Nazis, as we know. Um, in 1939, my opa came back, um, but because he was a political prisoner, he had no rights. He got given a job by somebody who'd actually been a conservative, um, but they were united against a common enemy, an enemy so he worked as an importer-exporter. This is my Tanta, who at 14, um, she was taken away, um, oh no, at 17. At 14, she did an apprenticeship in a department store, and then at 17, she was taken away to do a land year, so she was like a land girl, but normally you do it locally. She was taken to the Polish border in Silesia because she was the daughter of a political prisoner. And then instead of coming back home, they then sent her to man anti-aircraft guns because they were running out of soldiers, so they used the daughters of political prisoners, um, and she said it was the most terrifying thing she had ever done in her whole entire life. 
1944, my granddad was taken away by the Gestapo again, this time because he was one of the known opponents of the Nazis. Um, so they took him to near Paris to a hard labour camp under the auspices of organisation TOTE, who were responsible for the wartime infrastructures, building bridges, roads, all that kind of thing. Um, he didn't really talk much about that time, but he had a friend who was a doctor and they played imaginary chess. They used to make chess boards in the sand and play chess. And then in 1944, the guards ran away because things were starting to look really bad. So my granddad and the doctor managed to find a truck that had some petrol in it. They drove it until the petrol ran out and then he walked the rest of the way home. In the meantime, my tanta, at the age of 18, was also walking home from Berlin to uh, North Germany. Um, when he got home, my great-grandmother opened the door to him and uh, shut the door again in his face, went and got my grandma. My grandma opened the door and said, oh my God, you can't come in because they're still watching the house. Uh, he said, I've walked all the way across Europe, I'm coming in. And my great-grandmother said, yes, of course he is, don't be stupid. Um, so they let him in and they hid him in the attic. So my mum's bedroom was right at the front of the house and then there was a kind of junk space with a curtain across. So my opal was hidden in there and they didn't tell my mum because my mum was nine and they just couldn't risk her going to school and saying, oh, my dad's in the attic. So she used to walk past him every day and not know that he was there. Um, so things were really starting to unravel by this point, even though the Nazi propaganda was still saying, oh, it's all fine. So at some point, my tanta arrived back. Um, I've gone over time. Can I just keep going until the end? Where is it? Okay, um, so my tanta comes back, and uh, there's the happy family reunited. Um, but in April 1945, my mum turned 10. She was old enough to join the Bundes uh, League of Deutsches Mädchens, which was the girls' version of the Hitler Youth. And it was about the only argument my grandparents ever had, because my opa said she's not joining, and my oma said she bloody well is, because <laughs> it's all going to fall apart anyway, and I'm not having another child taken away. Um, at school, my tanta had not been allowed to take part in PE. She'd had to just walk around the field with the other dissident kids. Um, so she never went to a meeting, she never had a uniform, but she did join. Um, throughout the war, my great-grandmother was very anti-Hitler, quite openly. She'd been midwife to people and she said, you know, I'll wipe their asses. I, I don't care what they think of me. Um, they grew their own food, they ate their own bunny rabbits. Um, at the end of the war, they had uh, nothing, they had rationing, the same as we did, um, they had no coal, they had to dig peat for heat, and uh, they all got sent off to the islands to be fattened up, the kids, and um, they got weighed every week, and if they hadn't got enough weight put on, they got really told off, and they got rubbed down with horrible smelly green soap that was meant to be good for their bronchial tubes. And they were meant to write to their parents every week, but my mother wrote a play instead. <laughs> Um, this is a certificate. After the war, the Allies um, put the political structures back in place, so the British, the Canadians, the Americans, and um, what they did was they reconvened the old town council, so the guys who were still left alive after the war, who had not been Nazis but had been either Conservatives or Labour Party members, they put them in place. So my granddad was made um, deputy mayor and then for the first free vote he was made mayor and that's the certificate saying he's Burgermeister Fischer. Um, that's how I remember my granddad. He was bloody lovely. Um, and they named a street after him. And this is me, my mum, and my three daughters standing under Burgermeister Fischerstrasse. We're very proud of that. And then this next one, my mother's got a baguette on her head. <laughs> <laughs> they were just mad for ridiculous hairstyles. Um, and that's my granddad, a bit older, as I remember him, and I love that picture because it, it was like, even after all they'd been through, they had a really happy, lovely relationship. And then this little guy is saying, tschüss, which means goodbye. Wow. Yeah, wow. No, no, no.
no, no, that wasn't long at all. That was fabulous, wasn't that? A fabulous and amazing insight into uh, into uh, into another world, another life. So, does anybody have any questions for Kate? Oh, straight up there. Hang on a second. Let me just come rushing with the microphone. Hi. Um, well, maybe the answer is going to be a bit long for you, but how did you end up here? Oh, okay. So, um, when my mum was 18, she said to her parents, I really want to go to England and I want to train to be a nurse. And they said, oh, no, no, no. She said, oh, please, 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 please. And she said, I promise, 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 I'll come back, I promise. <laughs> And they went, oh, okay, as long as you promise to come back. Um, so she came to England and she trained to be a nurse uh, in Grantham and then in Portsmouth. And at first she didn't have very good English, so she used to write down the entire lecture in English. She'd go back and translate it into German and then translate it back into English for her essays, which is mentally laborious. And then she went to a party with one chap, and she left with another chap. <laughs> um, and that was my dad. And then um, she said, well, you know, I'm booked to go home, thinking my dad would go, don't leave, Hannah, don't leave. And he went, oh, right, jolly good, okay. Um, so then she went home going, oh my God. And then uh, he wrote her a letter going, I can't live without you, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't think. And uh, he wrote to her parents and said, I'm completely in love with your daughter and wish to marry her. And that's that. Oh, that's fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a round of applause right there. Um, any more, any more questions? Any more questions for, for Kate and, uh, and a fabulous, fabulous bavard and tale? The, um, uh, I'm not, uh, oh, hang on, have I missed? No? The, uh, I, there's a, yeah, there's a hand over there, let me come, hang on, running, running around, and then, I come, the, uh, where, where was the hand, sorry, yeah, ah, oh. Right, it's an amazing story. Um, he was obviously a, an amazingly brave man. And do you remember your mother or telling you any stories about the fear they had that you may not come back or of people saying this and just, you know... Well, interestingly, I know. spoke to her today and I said, oh, Mum, I'm doing this talk. And um, she said how it's funny the things she remembers from her childhood because she remembers having a really happy childhood. Um, but she says... The thing about the jackboots and the Gestapo man, and her pram was broken, her dolly pram, she was about two, and he said to her, oh, don't worry, your granddad can fix that, and she was completely traumatised. This man in a great big black coat with black boots taking her dad away and saying, your granddad will fix your pram. Um, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> What was the question? I was just saying that he was obviously an extremely brave man, you know. He oh yeah, and then she said twice. to me, she said about the, this sort of innate um, fear and that certain things she knew she wasn't to talk about, like people listening to the radio in her house. But also, they did little acts of resistance, like, you know, my tante, who was not allowed to take part in PE and had to march around and round and was not allowed to join the Bundes uh, League of Deutsches Mädchens because she was a political prisoner's uh, daughter. But my mum, when they used to play um, Die, Die Fahne Hoch, which was the Nazi song, and they used to have to do the salute, and my mum used to curl her fingers um, as a little tiny act of resistance, which I just think is amazing. And they had all these books buried in the back garden um, by Jewish authors and communist authors and Russian authors. You know, that if they'd have been found, they would all have just been taken away and shot. And my mum does remember the second lot of book burning after the war, when all the Nazi stuff was burnt, and her friend Berta, my tante Berta, um, had an atlas that she hid because she didn't want it to be burnt, but it's got all little swastikas everywhere of where, you know, the Nazis had taken over the world. So I guess it did infiltrate on some level, but I mean, she was 10 at the end of the war, five at the beginning, and, you know, younger when they were taking away her dad. Um, so... Yeah, but at some level it must have impacted. But after the war, 
my opa completely drew a line under everything. My Oma, there were certain shops she wouldn't go in, there were certain people she wouldn't speak to because they'd been card-carrying Nazis. My Opa said, no, it's over, it's done, and now we just carry on. Yeah. Any final questions for, for Kate before uh, the, uh, I think um, it, it has been a fabulous... Shall we all sing Deutschland in France? <laughs> Can we thank Kate again for an absolute fabulous...